for some more. No. This is for the readers and the real folk. Ooh. This is for the readers and the real folk. Yeah. This is for the readers and the real folk. Living from coast to coast. This is for the people. This is for the readers and the real folk. Ooh. This is for the readers and the real folk. Yeah. This is for the readers and the real folk. Living from coast to coast. This is for the people. Time for some R&R. Welcome, 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 my readers and real folks. I'm your host, Monda Raquel Webb. Books, art, film, music, all together in one spot, celebrating us right here, right now, and every week. It's all art, and it's all good. Because that's who we are, and it's what we do. So now it's time for some R&R. Let's jump right in. This week on Readers and Real Folk, we witness a chilling account of what death leaves behind with filmmaker Chad Morton. We hear compelling tales of the dealer from Black Arts in America's own Najee Dorsey. And finally, trust me, you want to stick around to the end for this. We air the emotional worldwide debut of the video Run With Maud, a musical tribute to Georgia shooting victim, Ahmaud Arbery, by talented Atlanta-based producer, musician, and artist, Swerve Birdsong. But before we jump into the show, it's Art from the Start, where we showcase an artist's work available at blackartinamerica.com, the leading online portal for African-American art in the nation. This colorful and musical painting entitled Time Out comes from pioneering Brooklyn-based painter Ronald Walton. Walton's stunning image is a 40 by 36 oil-based paper on canvas painting framed in wood. And it's one that you can have hanging on your wall. Here's the thing. When you buy fine art from emerging and established artists at blackartinamerica.com, you can use our special Readers and Real Folk value code, which is R plus R5 at checkout for 5% of premier works by Black American artists. That's right. It pays to hang out with readers and real folk. Chad Morton is an author, screenwriter, producer, and executive. He is the founding CEO of Smash Entertainment, best known for the award-winning feature film, What Death Leaves Behind. He is also the creator of graphic novel and novella series, Noon, The Awakening. In What Death Leaves Behind, Lead character Jake Warren experiences recurring nightmares after a kidney transplant. He believes them to be visions of his donor's violent murder, sending him on a dark path of vengeance, leading to an unbearable truth. Paperwork looks good, uh, so, hey, I wanna introduce you to somebody. Yeah, Jake's my nephew. Basically runs a family business. And I basically take credit for it. And basically takes a bigger check. Are you gonna do the same thing to Alexis when she's old enough to work? Jake just had a baby girl, Alexis. Cutest thing you wanna see. I see trees of green. Oh, hey. Look who it is. How's it going? It's going all right. How you doing? Yeah, you know. Living the dream. Wait, how long have you been on the list? Me? Yeah. Whew, it's been a while. Maybe like four or five years? I mean, look, if you want to wager your spot on the donor's list, you know, <laughs> payment plan or something. You know. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> I've been number one around here for a long time. You just have to wait your turn, Mr. Number Two. Congratulations. Just a few lifestyle things to keep in mind from now on. 
I'll be giving you a few pamphlets to help you remember what you need and all the pills you'll be receiving as you'll be on long-term multi-drug therapy, which includes the tacrolimus, the cyclosporin, the anti-proliferative agents, as well as the prednisone. Now please keep in mind that this is long-term, so you will be taking these drugs for the rest of your life. One of the unfortunate consequences of cellular memory theory is that people dismiss people's experience. So an organ donor recipient may be dismissed as simply a little crazy or having hallucinations or maybe their meds need to be adjusted. Have you been experiencing any side effects? Something like that. To our Readers of Real Folk, this is Chad Morton. He is filmmaker, producer, writer, author, realtor. You know, we have to be multi-hyphenates these days and times. And we're going to touch on a little bit of each of that for you. For those who don't know, uh, it takes about, we're talking about the film industry. Mm -hmm. It takes about seven years to get a movie made. It takes some time. So I remember uh, Chad and I met up uh, a few years ago, and he told me about this concept. And I thought the concept was really great. It was really interesting. I'm like, yeah, you know, I might be interested. Let, let's, you know, let's continue the dialogue about it. So I get busy. Chad gets busy. I look up and Chad has a movie out. He's going to Sundance. He's on the film circuit. He's on Netflix. I think in, in less than seven years. So, um, Chad, I want to talk about that. I want to, you know, first of all, congratulate you on your success. Thank you. Thank you. You know, couldn't have did it without the great people involved. I'm, I'm certainly going to mention them as we go. So for this film in particular, I had done a short film. Uh, we had won a few awards uh, doing the film circuit with my first short film called Self Control. And after Self Control won a couple of awards, I really had the bug to do more, but I didn't necessarily have the project. I had some ideas, but I didn't have the project. And my cousin, who what definitely is behind is based off of, just after waiting for over 10 years for a kidney transplant, finally got one. And I tell this story over and over how the night he got the transplant, the night after, he called me and we talked for maybe 12 hours. I mean, it was late and we talked all through the night to the morning because my cousin's like my little brother to me. We're really close. And the second night came and he called me again and we just talked about how happy he was to get the kidney in how excited he was to be able to, you know, live a normal life and just talked about some other things. Then the third night he called me and I'm like, you know, Jay, I love you. Uh, Jay is what I call him. JT is his name. But I said, Jay, I love you. But man, I can't talk to you all night. man. And he's like, come on, just, just talk to me more. I don't want to go to sleep. Mm. And I said, you know, why don't you want to go to sleep? And that's when he went in and started to tell me what was happening when he would go to sleep, how he would have these, uh, visions, I don't even call them nightmares, but these, these night visions, these night terrors, where he would see this person, this person that he described to a T, you know, violently beating, uh, cutting this other person, the same person that he would also see in his dream, these two people fighting, and, 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 and it was very violent, and very bloody, and excruciating, and he hated it, and he couldn't get out of these visions, the only way to get out would be either to scream, in the dream so that his uh, girlfriend would wake him up or, you know, just talk all night, just talk through the night and stay up, watch movies, stay up, you know, put his kids on the bus to school the next day and then go throughout your day as normal as you can, taking quick cat naps as you can. And so I started to stay up with him, one, to keep him up and B, to just write down what he was seeing. So that's when the writer in you takes over and you're like, okay, what did you see? What happened this time? What happened that time? What did he look like? And, and Jay, being uh, the person that he is, could describe this person like down to his fingernails, to the black fingernail polish, the tattoos on his arm, uh, everything about him, the dirty brown hair, you know, the white feeder t-shirt. And so I put this into a story to find out who is this person? Who is this person that you're seeing? And what did he do? 
And that was the impetus of what death leaves behind. But when you start off with a concept, no matter how fantastic your concept may be, nothing happens until you get yourself attached to a producer. It was my job to sort of fill in the blanks. And Rachel, our producer, and Scott, our director, also co-wrote the script. So we sort of wrote this together. I had the outline, and then they came in, and we sort of formalized and finished it. And the amazing thing is, is Truth Stranger Than Fiction, when we were finished with the movie, we wanted to add one more scene, which ironically we didn't get to add. But I, we, I wanted to add one more scene, and I said, Jay, I need you to tell me what happened when the hospital called you and told you you had the kidney, because we're going we're gonna to insert this in the middle. And he said, sure, sure. He said, they called, and the first thing they say is, are you 20 minutes to the hospital? Because the kidney has a relatively short shelf life, and you got to get there and get prepped and get it inserted before it's no good. And he said, yes. And then they said, are you willing to take the kidney of someone who died of a drug overdose? And I said, yes. And I said, whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out. I said, Jay, are you telling me that the kidney you got came from someone who died of a drug overdose? He's like, yeah, I thought I told you. I'm like, no, you never told me, man. Like that. But it, fortunately, for, it fit the narrative of the film. But I never knew that. Wow. Okay. So um, you got your team together. Yes. You had your story idea. Now, for most filmmakers, especially independent ones, um, mm -hmm. we, we get stuck when it comes to actually being able to finance the film. So mm -hmm. how did you do that? Before this project, we wanted to do, my team and I, um, there were like four of us at the time, we wanted to do a project about athletes that lose all their money. And I met with a sports agent and I pitched him the idea and he had some ex-players who were interested in funding people who wanted to do projects. And there were four of us at the time. And we had like four meetings with this agent. The last meeting he said, you know what, it sounds good. I'm gonna give all this information to the guys and then we're gonna get back at you. After about 10 days, the call came and I'm all excited. Came at 11 o'clock at night, man. I jumped out of bed and I'm like, yes. I was like, all right, you ready? Let's, let's go. And he's like, yeah, I wanted to call you to tell you it's gonna be a no. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I, you know, I respect you and your time. And I wanted to say, you know, thank you for sharing everything, but they're going to pass. And I, I thanked him cordially and, and I hung up the phone. But from that moment on, I made it, I made up my mind. I will never have to ask anyone to start funding or fund a project of mine again. I'm going to get my own money. So what death leaves behind when what death leaves behind came, I was already crazy motivated as a real estate agent, just out selling, selling, and then stacking the money, having it ready. And then what death leaves behind sort of falls into my lap with what happened with my cousin. And I said, let's go. This was funded solely by me because I was determined to just do it. And I like to say that to people who are looking to get into this business. You know, there's no knight in shining armor that's going to swoop up and say, oh, this idea is so incredible. I've got to give you money for it. That doesn't happen. You've got to be prepared with your own money. Now, I'm not saying spend your own money because we always say, use, we always hear, use other people's money. And when you can, great. But you've got to have your own money. Not necessarily spend it, but have it ready. Because in, in essence, what happened with me, even though at the time it seemed like a terrible setback, was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Because one, the project that we were doing, unbeknownst to us, ESPN already had in the bag. They had a show called Broke. If we would have took their money, I'd have owed these guys money for a show that I certainly couldn't have pitched to ESPN, which would have called in question, could they have gotten paid back? That was number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, it taught me the lesson of the importance of not having to go to anybody and ask. So, you know, the one thing I want to stress to new people is, listen, no one's going to believe in you any more than you believe in yourself. You've got to show and prove to somebody that you believe in you. And you only believe in you when you put your money behind it. What have you done? What have you started? You know, how many books uh, uh, or ideas have you pitched? What do you have collectively on social media? Did you go and print your own books and get them ready for sale? You know, all of these things show your level of commitment. If you're not committed, why should somebody with money be committed? If you're not going to show them how far are you willing to go? And yesterday, you and I, I uh, talked briefly and got to mention about Tyler Perry and everybody sees Tyler Perry now for the great successful businessman that he is. But 
as he will say many times, when I first started doing plays and lived out of my car and two people showed up and one of them was my mother and people are like, you're crazy, you're printing more flyers and you're gonna do another play after you lost thousands of dollars on the last play? The common denominator to all success is persistence. If you don't give up, you keep going, eventually you're gonna win. Well, thank you. I mean, I appreciate those nuggets. And I mean, you silver line the heck out of that uh, money person telling you no. And, and, and sometimes adversity does kind of shape us and make us. So I appreciate you, um, you know, being very honest about that. And, you know, you look up and I don't know how, how many theaters you were released to, but- uh, I mean, 25, 25. And 25 that, cities, 25 cities. 25, that's a really good run. So, and so you have dual roles here. You know, we know I uh, wanted to kind of transition into Noon, The Awakening. Your, so, I mean, it's a book, but you have a graphic novel as well. I mean, is Graphic novel, yes. The graphic novel will be out this year. Uh, it's going to be spectacular. Let me just tell you, but, but before we even, okay, so I listened to it. And I'm like, ah, this is I couldn't even figure out, like, okay, it's Westworld, it's The Matrix, it's like, I don't know, The Black Panther, like, you know, Clash of the Titans, it was like Egyptian gods and demigods, and I love the way you did with the ladies and give them a, anyway, so before I give everything away to our readers and real folk, tell us about Noon the Awakening. I'm a huge comic book fan. I, I literally have maybe 10,000 comic books that I've collected since the 70s, you know, when I was just a little kid. So as my kids, I have five sons. As my boys grow up, you know, we would go see all the, all the fantasy comic book movies we'd go to. And it never hit me until we saw the remake of Clash of the Titans. I'm in the theater with my three sons. I had three sons at that time with my three boys. And I'm watching this movie. And at the end of the movie, I'm like, you know what? There's not one black person Mm. In this entire film, like zero, you couldn't get nothing. And it never, it just struck me for some reason with my kids, like here I am with my boys and I enjoyed the film, but you know, my kids need to see themselves represented on this screen. You know, we, we, we exist in this world and we can exist in this other world of fantasy as heroes and gods and and superheroes and all of that, then we're not, we're not getting our due. So you can do one of two things. You can complain about it or you can create your own. So I started thinking, what can I create that will show black people spectacular, beautiful, magical, powerful, godlike, black, black, blue, black, dark skinned, beautiful black people doing incredible, heroic, fantastical things. And I started researching Egyptian mythology and I created Noon the Awakening. And what Noon stands for in Egyptian mythology is the origin of all things, described as a dark, murky place. Well, that left me with a lot of leeway for my creation. We started with the book and we went, and what I did to promote the book and the preview comic that you could download for free at noontheawakening.com, you could download the preview. We started to give those away. We gave away the preview and sold books at Comic Con. I started, I set up a booth to go to Comic Con. I'll never forget. Our first Comic Con was the second biggest in America, was in New York, where there's, you know, they get 75,000 people, you know, a day. It's just amazing. We were there and I bring these black uh, cosplayers. And Rachel Ofori, again, was with me and she helped me design the costumes. For these, we had a basketball player, Cole Woods, who's now a model in LA, went to Pitt, played basketball. She's six foot four and she was ISIS. And we had her just decked out spectacularly. We had guys dressed as Egyptian gods and women dressed as Egyptian goddesses. And we, without a name, without any recognition, without any history, we were flooded. Our booth, it was amazing. We were right next to Sergeant Slaughter from WWE uh, fame. And he was like, yo, what are you guys doing? Where'd you guys come from? Because we had so many people, but people were hungry for it. Who are these people of color? What is this all about? And that kind of reaction, it, it, it was so exciting. Um, it, it drove me to get to the next step. 
where we did Noon Origins, which sort of just gives you, which is on YouTube, which sort of just gives you a little backstory of each character and sort of sets the table. You were right on target when you said The Matrix. Thinks, if you think Game of Thrones meets The Matrix, you have Noon the Awakening. And this will be a spectacular piece with people of color. I can't wait to get to the live action portion of it. We are gonna hit them right in the face. I'm just <laughs> glad that this is the time for us and for creators such as yourself, you know, myself and everybody else out there. No one's coming to lift our project and tell our stories. We have to tell our stories. The world is open for black entertainment and creators such as you and I. And I can't wait to help fill that void. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fantastic. I mean, we, you can tell even from a business standpoint, again, going back to the business, uh, with the love that was shown for Black Panther and the Luke Cage mm -hmm. of the world and Black Lightning. I mean, there mm -hmm. is um, definitely an audience. And I think there are people who need it that don't even realize that they need it mm -hmm. in terms of the imaging, in terms of the impact that it has on us overall as a people. So, um, Chad, I just, I, I'm, and you know, you talked about punching people in the face. I'm like, is there anything you want to say about Smash Entertainment? Well, Smash Entertainment, you can find us at smashentertainment.net. Uh, reach out and find out what our upcoming projects are. You can get all the, there's a link there to get to Noon the Awakening. So Noon the Awakening has its own website, but there is a link from smashentertainment.net to get there. Find out where you can find and watch what death leaves behind. But when I created Smash Entertainment, I said uh, our tagline will be defining the future of entertainment. And I meant that. I meant that with regards to, you know, video, film, movies, and the future meaning where people of color can come in and make their imprint. Um, we're gonna hit people in the face with just the most fantastic stories. And I look to support everybody out there of color who's doing something great. And I hope to earn their support as well. Hey, Black Art in America fam, welcome to another episode of Tales of the Dealer here at Readers and Real Folk. I hope you're enjoying it. So let's go back to 1972, I believe the year was, if my memory serves me correctly. There's this young doctor just graduated, I mean, just uh, finished his residency, but he loved art. And he came into contact with Barclay Hendricks, loved his piece that was $1,200 takes it home and shares it with his wife and his mother-in-law just happens to be living with them at the time. And once she got wind of how much money he had spent, granted a young couple, you know, just finished his residency, $1,200 was a lot of money for them back in 1972. She tells her daughter, girl, you might want to get rid of this one. He's going crazy, right? So needless to say, from 19, 1972 to some of the current prices that we're seeing with Barclay Hendricks works topping a million on the secondary market at auction. Never know what it is on the primary market with his dealers. I'm sure it's more than that. Um, <laughs> hey, what can you say? Sometimes you just never know what's going to happen and who's going to blow. But kudos to that young physician for picking out a quality work for what became a very important artist. Live with the art you love. This is Najee Dorsey, and this has been the episode of Tales of the Dealer. That's right, my readers and real folk. 
this is a hostile takeover. So strap up for a ride on the r and Express with DJ Haas. Special shout out to my web queen, Mondo Webb, and special shout out to blackartinamerica.com, the top spot in the nation to bathe your four walls in premium black art. Check it. Like so many others across the nation have, we're gonna run with Ma and honor the brother who recently and unnecessarily lost his life in Georgia. This is a worldwide premiere of the song Run With Maude from multi-talented ATL-based artist, musician, and producer Swerve Birdsong. The song and video were completed a day after Swerve learned of the tragedy to honor 25-year-old victim Ahmad Aubrey and to speak of the unique and challenging moment we find ourselves in as a people. Here it is on Readers and Real Folk, Swerve Bird Song, the worldwide premiere, Run With Maud. Check it. I run with my yeah. Hashtag I run with mud Justice for mud yeah. Personally I don't know you but we all do We feel what you're going through One love, one mind, it's breaking our hearts too One could even argue we're actually family Same skin, similar roots, struggling for humanity Some days I jog Sunday, that could've been me One day Rob Joe Young days, that could've been me Gunplay gun down your runway when you was taking off We'll never know the portion of purpose that they were spraying off F Corona, racial injustice is the crisis How the world open for murders, but shut down for a virus For money lost, their surpluses, for black lives, their sirens They scared of us in their neighborhoods where all the violence lives In Apple playing games, my max battery swole up $4,000 machine defectiveness should never show up All that to say this song couldn't wait for the lab For keeping hope alive, I guess I'll use my iPad Hashtag I run with mod I run with Ma Hashtag I run with Ma I run with Ma Let's get it I'm running my 223 Slip on my Adidas Mask up, nerves, bad shit I caught the heaters Uh oh, they waving flags up I'm waving my black skin Hands up, don't shoot Please don't treat me black again yeah. But Arbery was swinging Till his last rep yeah. But Arbery was swinging Till his last step yeah. But Arbery was swinging Till his last rep Negro, use my hero Use a legend You didn't pass death Woo! Trying to hold cries To keep back the distortion My eyes tearing up From all his gifts That got aborted To those two men Look at your lives From all the hate you hoarded What if the police Were being Called and place it at recording. It's bittersweet. I'm thankful we got back the clip. That this wasn't a police episode of them cocking back clips. Till we out of here like Neptunes. I'm grinding like the clips. Black lives matter. I vote reparations for my. I run with my. Hashtag I run with my. Yeah, justice for my. Yeah, let's get it gone. Sing it. Can't believe, can't believe, can't believe what we I'm sick of this mess There's a couple things that some might just I must address Just because I'm black it doesn't mean that I'm a threat And just because you white it doesn't mean that you the best now I'm saying F them politics, I'm here to speak my peace We built the freedom Americans enjoying our past of peace I'm here for revolution, rebuild the constitution I want freedom to live, we already got freedom of speech And freedom to tell my white brothers the truth, they not supreme In public schools should teach blacks they the first kings and queens It's not in our culture to rob, steal, kill, and deceive That's the founders, we were white Watch, clear up our history for my Can't believe, can't believe, can't believe where we at now Hashtag I run with my Can't believe, can't believe, can't believe where we at Justice for my Let's get it Well, that does it for this week's edition of Readers and Real Folk Remember Join us here each week at blackartinamerica.com for new episodes. And you definitely want to tune in for our upcoming exclusive interview with world-renowned songstress, 
and two-time Grammy nominee who's chart-topping songs and videos for One Thing and Why Don't We Fall in Love have been viewed over 60 million times. The one, the only, A. Marie. And don't forget, you can get 5% off at checkout for fine art at blackartinamerica.com when you use our special value code R plus R5. That's R plus R5. So until next time, this is your r and R host, Monda Raquel Webb, wishing you art, peace. This is for the people. This is for the readers and the real folk. Ooh. This is for the readers and the real folk. Yeah. This is for the readers and the real folk. Living from coast to coast. This is for the people. This is for my people, yeah. This is for the people. This is for my people, yeah. It's time for some R&R. &R.